So good to always come back to our Bible study. And uh, we're talking about the kingdom of God, which is God's number one priority. That we begin to understand we are children of the kingdom of God. The Bible is a book about the king, his kingdom kids, and this kingdom. That's what it's all about. And uh, the meek shall inherit the earth. And when you pray, pray, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is being done in heaven. In other words, colonize the earth, God. When you pray, colonize our earth. Make it like heaven where your presence is. And so when God comes and dwells in the midst of his people, it says there shall be no more pain. There shall be no more crying because God will wipe away all tears. There shall be no more death. You know, this entire world is groaning for that time. That's what the scripture says. It's groaning for the time where God's people uh, will be redeemed totally and the earth can once again live. Now, when man died, in the sense that when sin entered into the world, he said, in the day that you sin, you shall surely die. It was a pronouncement, not only to the man, but upon the entire earth. That's why you find plants dying, the grass withering. Now, all this is death. It's a picture of death. Uh, it talks about, you know, where, where animals start dying. Everything, there, there's a time frame to everything now. Now, before that, Man lived in the glory when God created man. His intention was that we live eternally. There was no such thing as the word death. Death would not come into this world, but for man's sin. So everything, all creation is groaning because they are dying. You know, we look at our planet and we think of it. That's why we want to live. Leave this world. Uh, this world is not my home. No, this world is your home. This world is your home. Grasp that. But when God's kingdom comes in, things change. I mean, literally, uh, we've seen many, many videotapes on what happens when the gospel of the kingdom comes into a community. Things begin to change. The ground begins to change. The very ground that they live on begins to have life like it never had before. What happens? They are bringing God back into this world. When you begin to pray and seek God, you are bringing God down into your midst and in the presence of God, in the midst of great pain, we can have great joy. Why? How is it possible? For Paul, and I always use that, Paul and Silas to be singing at midnight, having been beaten and chained in a, in a, right down there at the sewer point of a prison. How could they be singing at midnight? Praises to God, except that the presence of God comes in and the atmosphere. I've read people who have suffered in certain countries where they are put naked on ice to make them suffer because they are Christians and they are singing praises. How is it possible for Nero to set Christians, you know, put tar on them and set them on fire and the Christians are singing? They are singing, praying. How is it possible for Stephen, while he's being stoned, pray for the forgiveness? I, what's, what, what, what did he say? He said, I see Jesus. And when Jesus is there, you need to understand everything changes. And that's the, the, the good news of the kingdom of God when God's kingdom comes in. That's what we're talking about. Amen. So uh, coming back to our study again, last week we talked, I mean, I, I get excited. Okay, I get really excited when we talk about uh, freedom and, and Galatians chapter 5, that whom Jesus has set free, you know, he, God has set us free. For It is for this that Christ has set us free, that we might be free. Uh, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1, which was last Tuesday, we talked about God being a God of, of business. We said that information does not necessarily ensure transformation. It is following through on the information you, rec you receive that brings about transformation. Okay, so today we want to talk about uh, understanding kingdom uh, management and kingdom living involves our own life management. When God wanted to re-establish the lost kingdom, 
call it the lost kingdom because the kingdom was kind of lost in the process. Man did not understand. That's why even until today we say we do not want a king. We, we rebel against a king uh, because of the way the kings of this world, this earth, have really polluted the whole idea. They have corrupted the idea of ruling over people in peace and in love and making sure that the citizens prosper. They, they just enriched themselves. And so mankind began to cry out against the establishment of kingdoms. But God wants to establish his kingdom upon the earth that Adam lost. And so he started by, by uh, with the nation of Israel. He started with a man called Abraham. And he said, we're going to start new. I'm going to start doing this. Okay, Adam kind of failed, but I'm going to start it with a man uh, out of nothing. A man uh, who was a Babylonian. A man did not really know God at, at all. And God said, I'm going to start with you. You know nothing about me, but I'm going to reveal myself to you. I'm going to become your friend. And we'll talk about that in just a, a few moments. But, you know, uh, he became God's friend. God says, Abraham, my friend. So God began to start with Abraham, and then you had the nation of Israel. Now, after some time, they had the 12 sons of, of uh, Jacob. And uh, eventually, those 12 sons became the 12 tribes. But after Joseph's time, they kind of lost their identity and they forgot that they were tribes. They, uh, they were now just a bunch of slaves. That's why I said in our last lesson that when, they, when you watch the Ten Commandments and they come out of Egypt, they are all coming out just like a whole bunch of people. There's no order whatsoever. So God begins to establish order. He begins to set up the tribes. Uh, the encampment of the tribes was so important. So many tribes on the, the west side, so many tribes on the east, uh, east side. Right in the front of the east, uh, east side must be Judah. Why? Because when the sun rises up, Judah, praise must welcome him. God began to establish order in the center. Right in the center uh, was the tabernacle. God had to be the center. Jesus be the center of it all. Jesus be the center of it all. So the tabernacle, everything about the tabernacle actually represents Jesus. All right? So Jesus be the center of it all. He's in the center. All the tribes are organized right next to him. This is kingdom management. Okay, they began to manage the kingdom, how they were supposed to enter the tabernacle, enter the, his gates with thanksgiving, a grateful heart. Enter his courts with praise. So there, there is order given uh, to the people who never had order before. The only order they had was the ordering of the oppressor. Right? But they never really learned to manage themselves. We talk about it was easy to manage them but it was difficult for them to manage themselves, right? So that's the problem God had. Now, the opposite of, of kingdom management or, or life management was the first king that God appointed over this kingdom. And uh, he was setting up this kingdom. And so the first king he appointed was Saul. And Saul was the perfect example of a person who refused to be managed by God. Totally different. God's intention was that man functions under his management. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he shall direct your paths. He shall tell you how you're supposed to be living and managing your life. But Saul, you know, not one prayer is recorded of Saul. Not one prayer. Saul never, King Saul never ever prayed. But if you find David, you find him, early will I seek thee. Three times a day, I will cry out to God. Sometimes I cry out seven times. At night when I lie in my bed, my meditation is of you, O God. When I'm in trouble, whom do I turn to? I turn to you. You are my strength. From whence, you know, I lift up my eyes to you from where my help really comes from. So God rejected Saul because Saul rejected God's management over his life. So in the history of Israel, every king that God appointed was meant to represent him or his kingship over the earth. 
That's why Jesus, when he came, he said, he came as the king, all right? He was born as king. You know, they came to worship. They came looking for a king. The wise men of the East came looking for a king. Uh, and so from the moment he was born, Jesus was already king. He was bringing in, even as an infant, the kingdom of God. He sits in the temple. He starts talking about things that even the Pharisees could not uh, comprehend. He was way beyond his years, at 12 years of age. He, he was king all throughout. He, he was king over the circumstances. He was king over the abuse. Uh, he still ruled his life. He managed his life so well compassion towards every person there was no uh, regard as to uh, whether they were poor or whether even when they were sick and he was not supposed to touch them he did he was king over every situation he was king over disease he was king over the storms he was king over death come on he was king uh, over nature itself he was king, man. I mean, he could turn water into wine. He could take bread and multiply. He was king all along, uh, even when he was in this world. But the thing is, he was the king that represented the king, the great creator king. That's why Jesus said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. Everything that I do, everything that I say, I do what my Father tells me to do. So, you know, in how how we manage by by God? It says in Romans chapter eight and verse fourteen that those who are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Which means that the Holy Spirit wants to lead us. We need to pay attention so that He can lead us. Every time I do my Bible study, you know, I'm so grateful. I can sit down in a little while and while I'm doing my, you can come and ask me questions while I'm doing my studies. You can ask me questions about the Bible and things like that. I would immediately flow into it. You can ask me for a little sermon concerning something that you would like to build on and immediately I could do it while I'm doing my study. Why? Because there is a flow. The Spirit of God helps me. And while he is helping me, he can help anyone who is just, just at, in, in that atmosphere because that is the atmosphere where he is now leading, he is now teaching. What am I saying? I'm saying when we begin to allow the Holy Spirit to help us, anyone coming into that atmosphere that you are in, in your business, in your, uh, in your school, wherever you may be, if you are just you know, in the presence of the Lord and you are seeking him, I'm telling you, man, you will have answers that you never ever thought about knowledge will start to flow. It will start to increase. That's why we say before you go to work, as you are going to work, as you are driving, for goodness sake, man, don't just listen to uh, Hits FM or whatever it may be. Turn, turn that off for a season because sometimes the noise, you know, we, we listen to the noise. We've got no time to hear his voice. And we do know that at times he speaks very silently. And without us realizing it, he's leading us. God is leading us. This is kingdom living. This is kingdom management. Whereas we are driving in the car, we say, Lord, be with me today. Let the atmosphere of the Spirit fill your car instead of the atmosphere of the world. So to understand uh, kingdom management, there are some principles which we've got to grasp. Repetition is sometimes the best teacher. Uh, sometimes I was telling Pastor Life and I watched an old movie some years ago I watched and then I just watched it again um, and, and in that movie sometimes you learn a thing or two I was sitting with Jonathan's girls and they were watching the Prince of Egypt and I asked them have you watched the Ten Commandments and they said no no they haven't watched it and uh, so I told them I've watched it about five, six, seven times. I don't know how many times I love that movie because suddenly you see, you know, the power of God coming in. I mean, it was uh, special effects those days. They can't do the same thing today. They tried to do it with, I think it was Exodus, uh, you know, with Richard Crowe as being Moses, whatever it may be, and a little boy being God, which was ridiculous. Uh, you know, and uh, but anyway, they have tried to do that many times, but none of it can match the Ten Commandments. But as you watch a movie again and again, you kind of like, hey, I didn't see that before. And so that is 
the same with the Word of God. I mean, totally different in the sense that the Word is spirit. That's of the flesh, but the Word is spirit. But God's spirit sometimes, you know, wants us to be reminded. And so he tells us again and again. Uh, if you look at the scriptures, you find repetition going on. So today, I may be repeating a few of the things that we have already heard before, but they are very important. So principle number one is the principle of ownership. Principle of ownership. Psalm 24 and verse 1, God claims the world as his. He claims it. The devil has got no claim. The devil cannot say, oh, God, a man lost it to me. No, no, no. It was never ours to give to the devil. Never ours to give to the devil. God owned it. Everything and everyone from the goodest to the baddest, everyone belongs to him. That's right. He has got a say in all our lives. That's why he could take a man, a king by the name of Cyrus, and he calls him my anointed one, if you read the word. The guy was not a believer at all, knew nothing about God, but God calls him my anointed one. God tells us that he places those in authority over us. Talks about uh, the ones that carry the sword. I mean, the, like the policemen and all that. He says, they are appointed by me so that you guys can have peace. We never look at, that, at it like that, do we? So God owns everything, okay? Fundamental principle of biblical management is this. God owns everything. We are simply managers or administrators acting on his behalf, okay? So management expresses our obedience regarding the administration of everything God has placed under our control, right? Everything that God places, which is all encompassing actually. It covers every area, okay, where we talk about everything. Remember that God bought us. Once you are bought, you are owned. He bought us not with silver or gold, but he has bought us with the precious blood of his son. I am owned by God. That's the first principle. And everything, if I am owned by God, everything I have has been provided by God. And therefore, you know, it, it, he owns it all, everything that we have. So kingdom management is the commitment of oneself and possessions to God's service recognizing that we do not have the right of control in your notes. First blank, commitment. The second is we do not have the right to control, of control over uh, our property or ourselves. This is my son, this is my daughter, which is, yes, God has given that to us. But at the end of the day, I also recognize that they belong to God. That's why uh, over the past uh, few months, we have been dedicating some babies. Oh, man, I wish they would all be in church, but they can't come to church. So we go to the house and we dedicate. And I keep reminding the parents that this is God's gift to you. But at the same time, you have to understand that God owns this and one day God's going to hold us uh, you know accountable to him we'll talk about that in just a moment all right but they are owned by God Deuteronomy chapter 8 God is warning the children of Israel because and that's a warning to us as well verse 17 and verse 18 Deuteronomy chapter 8 be careful not to say in your heart my power and my strong hand has made me rich don't say that. Careful not to start feeling inside. Do not say in your heart. You may not say it verbally. You know, hey, I'm a self-made man. You may not say that, hey, I, I worked so hard, so I got all of this. Some people may say that, which is, you know, you kind of, you, usually when people say that, you kind of frown, you know, you kind of give them a little smile, but inside you're thinking, man, this guy is a braggart, you know. Uh, he, he wants to just brag. He's a braggart. But, I'm a self-made man kind of thing. So don't allow it to creep into your heart where you say, I made this by myself. But remember the Lord your God. Church, please, at all times, please remember the Lord your God for it is He who gives you power to become rich. 
It is he who is giving you the power to be rich. Like I always say, I'm reminded that I'm just one heartbeat away from death. I could go. The moment he says, all right, heart, enough with David. Stop it. Stop the clock. <laughs> the stopwatch on my heart. And I'm gone. Right? We need to understand that our lives are so fragile. The wisest man of all <laughs> before Jesus, Solomon, said, man is like grass. He's here today. He's gone tomorrow. All right? He's like a vapor. When the sun comes up, man, the, the, the mist is gone. Vapor is gone. Man is like that. So remember that it is God at the end of the day. Amen? So the first principle is the principle of ownership. Principle number two is the principle of responsibility. Principle of responsibility. The price of greatness is responsibility. Quote, unquote, Winston Churchill. The price of greatness is responsibility. How do you become great? Responsibility. First, First Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. To all the rich people in the world, I command you. Who's he talking to? Christians in the world. Paul is not commanding the world, the rich people in the world. He's got no say over their lives, but he's talking to Timothy, writing a letter to him and saying, Timothy, read this out in church. When you get there on Sunday morning, all the rich people in church, in this world, in this world, you're rich in the world. I command you not to be wrapped in thoughts of pride over your prosperity or rely on your wealth for your riches are unreliable and nothing compared to the living God. Trust instead in the one who has lavished upon us all good things, fulfilling all our needs. Now the scripture says, God has given us all things to enjoy, but we've got to be responsible. When I first went to the United States, I think it was in 1970, uh, 1982, 1981, 82, I can't really remember. And uh, that was my first time traveling with a group of people. And the first place we went to was Los Angeles. And they had a big convention that was going on. We were there just for a few days. And in the, uh, uh, there were so many different speakers. And, and, and when I was there, I happened to meet this person whom I recognized almost immediately because of magazines and things like that. His name was Demos Shakarian. Demos Shakarian was the founder of the full gospel businessman that you have around the world today. He was, um, I mean, a, a millionaire. Of course, people say, don't use the word multimillionaire. You're either a millionaire, <laughs> you have more than a million, you don't, you're still a millionaire. But the point is, very, very, very wealthy man but totally humble, totally, I mean, he, he just comes up to you, he hugs you, I mean, he, the way he talks to you, he makes you feel uh, just so at home, uh, a very humble man in spite of the wealth that he has, absolutely humble, giving all the glory to God, testifying of how God blessed them when they came over, I think, from Russia to the, the United States. They, they had basically nothing and how the Lord began to bless them all acknowledging constantly the Lord. And I realized, you know, there, there were other businessmen also with him who were, my, I mean, all of them were millionaires, but they were so humble. And the way they talk, brother, my brother, my, you know, and constantly, I mean, I, I was a skinny little guy <laughs> at that time, really skinny little guy. And, and they thought maybe, you know, like most would think I was from India. <laughs> and so uh, when you tell them you're from Malaysia and all of that, oh man, they hug you, they talk to you, and, and they are so nice, so down to earth, not taken up with pride, not talking about how good they are, avoiding you, having bodyguards around them, you know, and, and people must avoid, and, and they brag about how rich they are. People who are wealthy and who know God, they are totally different, although God has blessed them so richly. So here it is in your notes. Owners have rights. Managers have responsibilities. 
Once again, owners have rights, but managers have responsibilities. Deuteronomy chapter 14, when it talks about the purpose of tithing, why does it tell us to tithe? Why do we tithe? It says there very clearly, the purpose of tithing is to teach you always to put God first. That's the purpose of tithing. It's not that God needs uh, your 100, uh, your, your ringgit, or uh, your salary of uh, a thousand ringgit. If I'm getting a salary of a thousand ringgit, God doesn't want that thousand ringgit. He gave you the power to get that thousand ringgit. All he's saying is, give me 10% to show me that you honestly put me first. That's all. And even then, it's not like, you know, I'm throwing the money up and God's grabbing it. He doesn't need it. God definitely, especially God doesn't need ring it. All right. Singapore dollars maybe. No, no, I'm kidding. But he's just saying, I don't need that. I'm just asking you to bring it into the storehouse so that at least the, the church can function well, the ministers can function well. But that's your responsibility. And the reason why I ask you to tithe is to prove to me that you are putting me first. That's all. All right. If you don't want to tithe, then take that to God. This is not for me to say anything. I don't, I don't ask who's tithing in church. I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying that is our responsibility. Your responsibility is to give your tithe. That's all. It's your responsibility. It shows that you are fulfilling. Owners have the rights. Managers have the responsibility. I gave you the finances. Now let's see how you function with this. Very first thing that you do with your finances. First thing, number one. Pay to God what is due to God. Now that is payment to God. That's not an offering. That's your payment to God for the air that you breathe, the food that you get in your table, the strength that he puts inside of you to go to work every morning, the fact that you can wake up every morning. That's a gift of God. Put me first. So number three, the principle of accountability. The principle of accountability. So we have in Matthew chapter 25, verses 14, right down to verse 20, he talks about uh, the, the parable of the talents, where he comes and he gives uh, the master, he's leaving the house, he's going to travel. Before leaving, he entrusts his property to his servants. According to the abilities of each man, one servant receives five, another receives two, another receives one. When he returns, he calls them all to give an account. Now, listen. It starts off by saying he told them about a parable concerning the kingdom of heaven. So now it is a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning or a very natural story with a spiritual meaning. So when he tells them this, he's talking about uh, accountability. This is the maxim of this parable, right? God entrusts authority over creation to us, and we are not allowed to rule it as we see fit. We're supposed to uh, call to exercise. Now, in your notes, I put that, I put this down, so you might as well uh, write this down in your notes. We are called to exercise dominion. Remember dominion? Kingdom. Kingdom under the watchful eye of the owner. Again, we are called to exercise our dominion under the watchful eye of the owner, us managing his creation in accord with the principles he has established. Right? I exercise dominion over the watchful eye of the owner, I manage his creation according with the principle he has established. So there are certain principles that God has given to us. I mentioned one concerning tithing, uh, uh, talking about other areas. You can begin to discover them as you go along. Okay? So even as a church management, we have a board. Now, later on, we'll begin to have elders and then the board but we are accountable we are accountable and uh, in, in case you do not know something about how we manage uh, the finances I mean signing of checks and things like that I cannot sign the check alone there is always two signatures the signature of the treasurer or the secretary 
I do not sign all the checks by myself. My, uh, I do not have one signature on the checks. There has to be two. One signs the other one. Why? Because at the end of the day, there has to be uh, an accountability. We have all our reports done. Then we have to submit it to the Registrar of Societies. We go through uh, our own accountant internal, you know, external accountant, make sure the accounts are all right, everything is on paper, we must give an account how we run our finances in the church. I do not make a decision just by myself. We sit down with the board, we say, is this okay? Shall we go ahead? Then when the board says it's all okay, we go ahead, then we go ahead. In order to purchase uh, like the overhead camera, in order to purchase musical instruments or, or our whole uh, setup for the... Uh, uh, whatever we are doing within the church, whether it's building project or whether it's to get cleaners to come into the church, everything, we begin to talk to the board and then the board says, okay, I think it's good. Can we have a second opinion? Can we have a different quote? You know, we, we have to do all these things so that no, uh, the church, we, we are held accountable to the church. And the world looks at us and they say, okay, your records are good and this is fine. That's why we have AGMs, which I, I don't like, annual general meetings. In fact, our general council, when they have their meetings, our assemblies have got to hardly go for the business meetings. Once in two years, they will have a minister's retreat. Then that one, if it is a, uh, I, I would possibly go. But when they have business meetings, I, I do not like business meetings, but it is necessary because we have to be accountable. So Romans chapter 12 and uh, chapter 14, verse 12, therefore each one, now we're talking about life management, managing your life, managing uh, understanding what kingdom management is all about. He tells us this, Romans chapter 14, verse 12, Therefore each one must answer for himself and give a personal account of his own life before God. Now, don't get frightened by that statement. Go, are you from the time I was a child, I have to give an account of everything that I've done. Uh, don't worry, God knows you. What he's saying is you've got to just stand before God and suddenly you will begin to understand so many things. The presence of God releases knowledge like never before. Because the Spirit of God is called the Spirit of Wisdom and Understanding. The Spirit of Wisdom and the Spirit of Knowledge. One of the gifts of the Spirit is the gift of knowledge. So they know without us giving an account. All right, God, I was born in this year and this is what happened. You, you don't know your past. You don't know what happened, but in the presence of God, all is revealed. Like it's it's just like a, a naked thing. Now, please, please understand something. Sometimes we look at this and think, "Oh, yo, the things that I did." Sometimes I'm so ashamed. Listen, if it is under the blood, if the blood has been applied, if you have asked for forgiveness, the blood washes everything away. But it's how we handle our life. Did we live it in the way God wanted us to live? He's not talking about your sin. He's talking about things that you could have done or could have become. I could have become. I could have done, but I did not do it. All right? And I would stand there and, and that's where I have to give an account of not only of myself, as you know, you have given me so many gifts, you have given me wonderful people in the church, and I have to stand and give an account of those people. I want to make sure that they have a proper understanding. Was I uh, truthful? Uh, did I manipulate people into doing things? Or did I use anyone that God entrusted me uh, with them? Did I make use of them in any way? Have I robbed them? Uh, you know, and, and so I want to make sure that all these things are dealt with accountability. Amen. Principle number four is the principle of rewards. The principle of rewards. Put your heart and soul into every activity. I like that one. Put your heart and soul into ac every activity and do, uh, you do as though you are doing it for the Lord himself and not merely for others. In other words, when you serve even your bosses and all of that, do it as unto the Lord. Remember that you will get your reward from the Lord. He will give you what you shall receive. You are working for Jesus, for the Lord Christ. 
That's, that's the, the kind of mentality I must have. I'm not working for my boss. I'm not working for anyone. I'm not doing this so that, you know, uh, this person will be pleased with me. I'm working as unto the Lord. So we do it with joy in our hearts. We support our children. We do things for our family because we are doing it as unto the Lord ourselves. Lord himself, we are doing it ourselves. Uh, a great favor when we do it in this way because there is a reward. The principle you know, uh, in, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, he says the same thing. Without faith, no one can please God. Anyone who comes to God, listen to this one, must believe. Anyone who comes to God must believe that he is real and that he rewards those who truly want to find him. Now, listen to the, uh, the translation, the Passion Translation. Without faith living within us, it would be impossible, impossible to please God. For we come to God in faith, knowing that He is real, and that He rewards the faith of those who give all their passion and strength. Remember uh, the earlier scripture, it says, put all your heart into your passion, your strength, into the activity that you are doing. Who will give, uh, though he rewards the faith of those who will give all their passion and strength into seeking him. Without faith, it is impossible to please God, for he who comes to God must believe. Think about that just for a moment. Did you know that faith is my responsibility, not God's? Faith is my responsibility. Faith is your responsibility. God places that onus on you. In other words, you have to develop your faith because God takes us from one level of faith to a greater level of faith. Faith comes by hearing. So what's my responsibility? Hearing. I've got to hear more and more and more of the Word. As I read the Word of God, God can sometimes speak to us, but mostly it comes when you begin to go into a cell group or when you come into a, 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 a meeting like this, into a Bible study, into uh, our Sunday morning service where we begin to share and you hear the Word of God. That's why I like to preach messages that will build your faith. When I talk about prayer, I'm talking about building your, your faith in God and trusting Him and believing that God will meet you. So faith comes by hearing, and I've got to hear. And when I begin to do that, then we, I must believe that God will reward me. Otherwise, why come to God? Why pray if you don't believe that God's going to answer? The reward is God answering me. So in your notes, faithful managers, two words, faithful managers who do the Master's will, will with the master's resources. Faithful managers who do the master's will with the master's resources can be, can, uh, can, can expect to be rewarded. They can expect to be rewarded. At, the, at this moment, it's incomplete reward. But when we see him face to face, a reward will be complete. Amen. Right? So, what we should be longing for, it says in Matthew 25 and verse 21, is when the master says, you have done well and proven yourself to be my loyal and trustworthy servant or manager because you have been a faithful steward to manage a small sum. Now I will put you in charge of much, much more. You will experience the delight of your master who will say to you, come celebrate with me. Isn't that wonderful? That's, that's what we are waiting for, for the master to say, you did a great job. You managed it so well. Everything that I gave you, you managed it so well. So as I said, management is the key to enjoying the freedom that God has given to us and enjoying the resources that God has placed within us. When we manage our resources, we can do it so well. As I uh, even talk to my children about becoming debt-free and learning to use your finances wisely. As when it comes, especially with this, you know, when you talk about the parable of the talents, you know what talents are? Money. 
money. Talents is actually money. It's not the talents we talk about, talent to sing and all that. The talents there actually literally means money. The master gave them money, gave you five, gave you five talents of gold. So it was money, managing of your finances. That's why uh, we, I, I've mentioned this to you before. The greatest enemy that we have is not the devil. It's money. That's why Jesus said, you, sh you cannot serve God and money. Money is so important. Money is the answer to many men's needs, uh, Solomon says. It answers a lot of questions when you have money. Right? Of course, people use it wrongly and bribe and things like that. But I always say, if you learn to manage your finances well, you will reap tremendous rewards. But if you don't, you will pierce yourself with many sorrows. What does Paul say? What, what does uh, the Bible say? Uh, Solomon, they that desire, those who desire to be rich, pierce themselves with many sorrows. Why? Because whatever they have is not enough. So they desire more and they desire more. They desire more. They cannot manage to live on what they have. Once you raise your standard of living to that high, and then when you're brought a little lower, you're going to find a great problem managing that. You have to learn to manage to live with what you have. What did Jesus say? Having food and clothing, let's be content. But people are never content with that. They always want more and more and more. The eye like hell is never filled. It wants more and more. It wants to be satisfied. So I pray that you will understand a little bit more about kingdom management, functioning well under uh, the principles that God has given to us, the principle of ownership, principle of accountability, of responsibility, principle of rewards. God wants to reward us, especially when we manage it. Now, in this world, as I said, you will be rewarded as well. The joys that come with proper management is tremendous. You will enjoy what, uh, you know, the blessings of managing your life well, managing your family well, your business well. The joys that come with it is really rewarding. Amen. So I pray that God will continue to bless you and reward you as you seek him and as you manage your lives well. In the meantime, have a great week all week.